David, what's going on, man? Welcome to the Dad Edge Podcast. Thanks for having me on, brother. It's uh, it's a good time. It's a sunny day here in Los Angeles, so we're good. Well, good. You know, hey, as long as we don't hear any gunfire or <laughs> you know, there's a drive-by in any way, shape, or form, if you need to take cover, anything like that, it might make the show more interesting or it might make us feel a little bit more on edge. So, sure. I don't. I don't think at the Hilton we're going to hear too much here. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully yeah. not. Well, hey, before we get started, man, I just want to say congratulations. Congratulations on the release of your new album. This is super exciting stuff, man. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, been a couple of years coming. Uh, it's an album called Revive, and uh, I think it's perfect in what the world needs right now. And uh, as we kind of come out post pandemic, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's good vibes, is what it is. It's a good vibe album. So. That's cool, man. What, what what pandemic are you talking about? Is there something going on? Like- <laughs> there, there- a little little thing that happened a couple of years where the kids got sent home with books and they were yeah. they were told uh you know um hey you might need to stay home for a couple of weeks in homeschool yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we ended up being uh you know full on teachers <laughs> i know so. right my god yeah you know i, I saw this I, I was talking to a friend of mine uh not too terribly long ago and he's like he's like hey listen he's like you know check this out what do you think of this scenario he's like can you imagine like 10 years from now, like, right. You'll be like in your fifties and you're cleaning, you know, the kids are, you know, they're pretty much kind of moving out and, and you're, you and your wife are just sort of like, you know, just tidying up and, and just getting rid of all the junk and maybe some old clothes. And, and you grab a pair of jeans you haven't worn in a long time. And you're going through the pockets and you pull out a mask. He goes, what comes right. to mind? And I'm like, Oh my God. Like literally like for a moment there, I was like, Oh God, do you remember this? <laughs> <laughs> it's you know it's one of those things where you're going to measure time as pre and post it's going to be one of those things in history um you know it's it's been a wild uh time but i think we you know for all the good and bad that's come out of it i think um the one thing that we've learned is we're pretty adaptable yeah with the, you know um and uh, a lot of businesses don't need a brick and mortar you know you can work from home we're uh you know i think it freed up a lot of people um you know, from the, from the daily kind of going into work grind and uh, realizing, I think it was good for us because we man, spent so much time with, with my kids. I wasn't touring. Um, I was being their teacher, you know, their PE instructor. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and it was, we spent a lot of quality family time, whether it was camping or um, just doing stuff that you wouldn't probably normally do, you know, because everything was shut down. And, and so, for better or for worse, I think it brought it together uh, a lot of good family time. That's it was, it was kind of like a moment in time of just you know we went up to uh, past um, we went up to Tahoe camping. We, we did Mammoth camping. We did uh, you know all all around California up to the Lost Coast, which was a magical time in the redwoods. So it was like these times I wouldn't have got you know we 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 got a lot of that good stuff. So. Yeah, you know what's so cool is so be, being on this side of the microphone, I've I've had the opportunity over the, over the past two and three years, and yeah, you know, it was obviously since COVID to interview <clears throat> quite a few of you guys who are in the entertainment space. You know, I've had John Cooper on from Skillet, Nikki Six, Ben Bruce, yeah, um, Russell Dickerson, and and Mark Roberts from OAR, and what I can say, all of you guys have said the exact same thing about COVID. You're like, you know, it was scary times, right? Obviously, in the entertainment space because you know, that's obviously how, you know, a lot of revenue is produced in that space is when you're on tour and, and those types of things. But every single guy that I mentioned who came on have, have said the exact same thing. It's just like, you know, it was sort of like this unwelcomed break in the beginning. And then it became sort of like this really beautiful experience with my family that I otherwise wouldn't have gotten, you know? Um, So I think that that's really, really cool is, is just being able to, you know, there's two types of people in the world. They're the people who are the victim and they're just going to complain and sit back and tell you why they can't do all these different things. And then there's, then there's another type of person who's like, you know what, we're, we're faced with this. So um, how might we make the best of it? How might we elevate our relationships and reconnect and maybe even go out camping and, and, and reconnect to nature and, and get back yeah. to, the, to the grassroots? So I think that's awesome. You did that, man. Yeah, man, it's, I think it's that creative mentality. Uh, so, you know, there's that common theme. We all have to think about, you know, as a musician, singer, songwriter, what have you, all thinking about things 
things we're used to thinking about problems, issues, uh, you know, that we're dealing with in our industry in a creative way. And I think we just had less time to think about our industry like that, or, you know, our, our songwriting craft. And so we poured that into family, you know, <laughs> like, okay, how can we make this the best of this, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah it's cool. definitely that positive, uh, glass half full type of thing. That's right, man quality of our lives and relationships are dependent on the quality of the questions we ask ourselves and people around us. So if we're asking like, why can't things go back to the way that they were, that's going to be our life. But we could say, Hey, we're faced with this. So how might we do this better? Or how might we, you know, create more depth and memories in our relationships? That's what we do. You know, um, I'm, I'm really, really curious. Um, you mentioned this new album that you had, you, you yeah. just came out um, that it's it's kind of right with it, it's it's exactly kind of what the world needs right now. And, and you mentioned like coming, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, coming off post pandemic. Um, so what can we expect out of the album that's in, in, in line with that? Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> the strange thing about the album is it was recorded right before the lockdown happened in March of 2020. We oh, really? finished Thursday. The next day, Friday, the kids got sent home with books. Right. <laughs> And um, we were all ready to go out on tour and all this kind of stuff. So these songs were written without, you know, a pandemic in mind or anything like that. But the way that the album's set up, um, it's a very uplifting and upbeat kind of uh, uh, album. And uh, with songs like, you know, Ask Her to Dance and Joyride and, um, you know, it, it kind of, it's kind of a beautiful thing where it was written pre and still has that magic of a time where you're not worried about you know wearing a mask or you know uh, lockdowns or shutdowns or any type of restrictions or anything like that it was kind of a free time and um and then it's being released in this post pandemic world where you kind of have this knowledge now of you know the sickness or virus or whatever and you know and uh, we've all gone through this common um global you know Uh, event together and um so there's kind of in a way there's magic in that uh in the music because it was it's kind of seen two worlds you know in in its life and um it uh yeah man it's just got like i said it's just got a lot of good vibes and i was playing in my neighborhood um you know during the lockdowns and stuff like that and um, yeah, I mean, it's, I live in like a suburban area in Huntington Beach and uh, we have, you know, driveways and all this kind of stuff. And so I took out, it was, you know, uh, March 13th, we locked down, maybe the 20th, I went out and told my neighbors, hey, come outside and drink with everybody rather than inside your house, you know? And, uh, you know, so we, uh, I took a little PA outside and, and uh, started playing like a happy hour kind of thing for my neighbors. And uh, people could be as physically distant as they wanted to be, but socially connected, you know, it was, uh, everybody was, you know, watching Netflix and drinking wine that whole week. And so, um, you know, everybody came outside and it was a beautiful thing. And I said, you know, I'll just keep playing outside until I go back on tour. And I, I played for every Friday for like 12 weeks and then other neighborhoods in the area started asking me to come out and play for them. And oh, I saw the good vibe and I was playing these songs that are on the album and, um, and the and everybody was just happy, man. It was just a real good energy through the neighborhoods. I saw neighborhoods come together. My neighborhood came together. You got to know your neighbors. Um, kids were riding their bikes through the streets. Um, you know, it was just kind of like a like a Fourth of July normal yeah, kind of thing, man. It was it was happening. It was cool. That is so freaking cool, man. That you did yeah. that. What was uh, take take me to the point where you made the decision to do that? Like, what was going on for you? Um, it was that, it was that first week and we were all watching our neighbors kind of walk around the neighborhood. Some, you know, everybody was, had their walking shoes on and, and, or they were, you know, neighbors that you'd never even knew existed in your neighborhood. You'd see them out walking around and, um, you're like, wow, everybody's just at home right now. Like this, this is wild. You know, um, the kids are outside, you know, we're doing homeschooling and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and I just think that I was like, you know what, babe, I'm, I, I need to keep my chops up a little bit. And I, I'm Jones in to play for some people. And I know I can put some good out in the world here. You know, let's just go 
do like a happy hour for the neighbors and see what happens. And so I did that and everybody was stoked on it. Yeah. And, and it was a cool thing. And it just became the regular gig and there was nothing else going on in town, you know, and, uh, you know, everything was shut down. So it became the only thing in town. We had like 300, 400 people on our street at one point. My wife was like, are we doing the right thing? And I'm like, oh, this is cool. Like those people would be partying anyways. Like, you know, um, you know, our older neighbors could be in their driveway. You know, the kids could be in, in the street. Some people I remember, you know, drew chalk on the ground to like outline their bubble. You know, I mean, it was cool, you know, and nobody cared. It was just, you know, everybody was just hanging out and um, in a collective, you know, and then I turned the music up super loud so everybody could hear it. People even, you know, we got uh, that, that didn't come out to the street. They would be in their backyards, like hanging out, you know, it didn't feel comfortable. So it was like, it was, it crossed all types of comfortability levels, you know, at that time. Um, it seems crazy just to think about where we were at that time where it was like, you know, toilet paper or, you know, I'm, I'm down an aisle and I just want to go down the supermarket aisle because I saw somebody down there. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to wait and go to the next aisle for food or something like that. Or you, yeah. you had one person go out like it was like zombie time, you know, from your household and you'd go out, get some food and come back in, you know? I mean, I think I even, you know, went as far as like, Hey babe, I saw like somebody on Twitter, like um, washing their food. And she's like, Oh, we're not doing that. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> so that, that is so freaking cool, man. Um, yeah. You know, it's yeah, you know, even like the toilet paper thing, man. It was like I completely forgot that even happened until you just mentioned that, and I was like, oh yeah, like wow. everybody was, yeah, right. Everybody was like so big into like what, what we're we gonna do about our toilet paper, right? But man, that is really really cool um, that you did that because you know a lot of people, man, like that that time really either brought out the best or the worst in people. Right. And, and to be honest, like everybody's decision, you, if it was a bad decision, it was sort of forgiven and justified. Be like, Oh yeah, I can understand why you're mean or unhappy or you don't want to play music for, for your entire neighborhood and that kind of thing. But instead, <laughs> you know, a lot of people like yourself, like just really rose to this beautiful occasion. And I'm, I'm dude, I, I've experienced some serious FOMO in my life, but you know, I I'm sitting here thinking like, man, that would have been a freaking cool time to live down the street from David. You know, I can only imagine like how cool that would be. Just that that's what we'd be looking forward to every Friday. Yeah, it was cool. And I streamed it in the beginning and uh, you know, and I had friends and, you know, uh, family that were across the country, just like tuning in every Friday night and other people. And they were like, I get comments like, man, I look forward to this so much. And uh, this is really bringing me up, you know, because people, a lot of people didn't go outside at all. Yeah. You know, maybe they, you know, I don't know, uh, at that time, you know, a colder part of the country or something like that. And we were pretty um, fortunate in Southern California that, you know, we have the climate that we do. So we can be outside a lot. And so it was, uh, it was a nice thing and, and something that, you know, it's that creative brain working, you know, how can I make this cool for everybody else too? So. You know, See, I, felt, I felt almost like a responsibility after a while. Like, okay, I got to keep doing this because it's bringing so many people up there depending on yeah. it. It's like, you know, so. See, that's what I'm talking about, man. That, that, be that beautiful question that we ask ourselves, right? And that was, you know, how can I make this cool for everybody else? You know, that's, that's, that's incredible, man. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm really excited to, to check out your new album, number one, especially now that I know the, the, you know, the, the, the time frame of when this was done and, and all like, and some yeah. of, and the explanation behind it. Um, I, I know we're going to talk about, you know, you have a daughter, you have a son married. We'll, we'll talk about marriage. We'll talk about kids, but going back to just your childhood and how you grew up, did, did you ever think that this is what you were going to do for a living? Or were you just like, Oh, it would be nice to do that, but I don't know if it's going to happen. Or were you like, Oh no, I don't have a plan B. This is it. Um, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, youngest of, uh, 10 kids and, I'm sorry, uh, what 10 yeah. <laughs> kids, the youngest of 10 kids, yeah. bro, <laughs> 10 kids, uh, dad busy and, uh, you know, and, um, but it was, you know, like a, a mixed family, you know, I have brothers and sisters and such, 
but uh, you know, a lot of them, we all lived in the same uh, house and stuff, you know, so it was my whole concept of um, family was so different from everybody else's because my family was so large, but I also had brothers and sisters that were um, the same age as my parents or my, my friends, uh, parents and such. So it was like, you know, my dad was born in 1932 and he grew up in Texas, dirt floor, Hispanic. Um, and, um, you know, at a time when he was growing up, um, he was picking cotton in the cotton fields with his mom. He was the oldest of eight. Um, and, uh, in the forties, fifties, Mexicans, uh, you know, Hispanic, uh, darker skinned, uh, people were treated poorly. They were often treated worse than blacks in Texas. And, uh, they weren't allowed to go swim in the swim, same swimming pools. Um, my dad won the Texas state football championship. Uh, he was an amazing football player athlete and, uh, he wasn't allowed to go, um, into the same restaurants that his whole team was. And so his coach said, you know, we're, we're not going to eat here at all. Uh, if him, you know, eat. And so it was one of those things where it was just like, my dad grew up in a different time and, um, he came out to, uh, California as a Marine, uh, during the tail end of the Korean war and, um, stayed. He, uh, liked California a lot like the weather who wouldn't and uh um you know uh fell in love had some kids and um you know got divorced and then my, my mom and uh, dancing uh you know nice you know kind of uh my dad was a big band kind of benny goodman fan and stuff like that and my mom dancing out in la one one day and um and then had you know the rest of his kids and so you know it was one of those things where um, he was LA Unified School District principal for many, many years. So he was uh, a firm believer in, you know, uh, being the first one there, last to leave type of mentality, worked hard and self-made. And so, you know, uh, I saw, you know, my dad would get up every morning and he would do his calisthenics, you know, as a, you know, it's really the only, like, my dad wasn't very like rough Marine you know, like Marine Corps, like when you think of like, yes, sir, no, sir, type of thing. He was very loving, but he, uh, he would get up and he was very regimented, um, with his schedule where he would get up every morning, do his running, his pushups, his, all that kind of stuff. So I saw that work ethic and then my dad, you know, like I said, he had to care for a, a lot of mouths. And so he, uh, he, he supported us really well. And then he was always there. I was the, out the tail end you know, uh, been the last one, but my dad was always there. I, we, let me preface this by saying you get a different, when you go through 10 kids, you get a different parent at oh, a yeah. different time than the oldest. Right? right. So my dad at that time had already established, he had his master's from UCLA. He, um, you know, he was already, uh, very well established. And so he was able to be my uh, baseball, travel ball coaches, you know, my basketball coach, you know, all that stuff. Um, and so I got a, a really good version of my dad and he just recently passed, um, you know, a couple of years ago. So he made it to about 88 and, uh, you know, he's, uh, he, he had, there was a lot of good example with what he, uh, he did and how I raised my own kids. So, yeah. Yeah. Can you give us um, a few more specifics on, on just some things that you glean from him, which by the way, man, just, and why you kind of chew on that question. Um, I'm always so curious as to when men come on the show and they talk about, you know, their experiences growing up and some of the things that they have embraced as like a, a beautiful lesson or a beautiful way to live or a really cool way to raise a son or a really cool way to raise a daughter. Or like I, my dad did this with me. So I'm going to do it with my kids cause I really loved it. Um, but you know, what's really cool, David is the way you talk about your dad. I don't know if anybody's ever told you this or not, but the tone in your voice, the look on your face, like, it's just like, you have immense, it just seems like anyway, just immense respect for this man and a lot of love. I, you know, uh, you know, when he passed a couple of years ago, it was like, uh, you know, your, your parents pass and it's a piece of you leaving as well. But yeah, I, um, you also, you see this life come full circle in a way, you know, or his legacy kind of 
wrapped up, you know, a little bit. And uh, my dad lived a very full, um, complicated at times, but um, a very full life. It was messy. It was it was uh, amazing, self made. I mean, it was it was it was kind of like one you'd want to write a, a book or a story about, you know, or or a movie. It's a really cool story, like his whole thing, and uh, and uh, it's it's the way life. I don't know. I hope to have a full life, um, you know, where, where my son's going, like, yeah, my dad lived it, you know? So, yeah. I want, I want every single guy in the audience to hear exactly what you just said. Like yeah. my, my dad had a life and he lived it. Right. We have too many men, David, that, you know, the definition of hell is meeting the man that you could have been when you're on your deathbed. I heard that from a quote from one of our previous podcast guests. And, you know, if you think about, the, the way a lot of us men, you know, the way we operate in our life is put our head down, you know, go grind it out and go, go make a living, provide, put food on the table. Don't ask for help. If you have a bad moment, just put your head down, man up, grow a set of balls, keep going. Right, right. And, and to be honest, like there's a, there's some nobility in that, but I also don't think it's the best example for your kids. So like, I imagine your son, I imagine your daughter who who's looking at their father, right? who is fulfilling a dream, right? And he's doing the work that he absolutely loves to do. And he's yep. able to provide for his family. And man, there is no greater lesson than, I mean, think about it. If, if you're a dad and you despise what you do with every fiber of your being and you're miserable and your kids feel that, like, what are we teaching them, right? I mean, I understand that some guys, you know, just in a way might feel trapped or maybe they feel that they don't have a choice or maybe you know, with the economy, the way it is, it's just the job that they have right now. But to, to see your dad, like do something that's fulfilling, like think about that for a second, seeing your dad do something that's fulfilling and able to provide. I mean, dude, that's, that's such a peaceful, cool feeling as a kid. It just makes them feel like they can, yeah. you know, and that's what, what, what you want to give your kids is the ability to do anything that they want to do in life. Yes. Right. Like give them the, the, um, the skills, give them the attitude that, Hey, this life is yours. Make of it what you need, you know, make, uh, be happy. You know, all you want is for your kids to be happy, right? Yes. That's, that's, that's when you break it down, that's what you're trying to build. You're trying to build character and for them to be able to handle this crazy world, but make of it what they'd like. And, um, and so my daughter just said to me the other day, she's like, um, she's like, dad, you know, this album, how cool is it that, you know, like my kids will be able to, you know, or my kids, kids will be able to hear this, you know, and to know, you know, that that's you. Cause I think she's heard me say that before yeah. where I'm like that in legacy in a way is that it's different. What I do for a living is different from, um, other arts where it's like, okay, you know, uh, paint a painting or take a photo. They'll my great, 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 great grandkids will be able to hear my voice and understand, uh, oh, this was coming directly from his brain. This is, this is his art. This is his music. This is the way he was feeling. Oh, this song is about, you know, his, uh, about great, great, great grandma, you know, or something like that, you know, my daughter or something like that. Um, or this is like how he met his wife, you know, or it's, it's almost like a, an audio storytelling, um, of, of, you know, history, at least the way that I summarize, you know, there's, there's a bit of truth in everything that I write. So, um, so a lot of stories, you know, I have a song on my last album called La Batalla, which means the battle in Spanish. And my dad actually gave me that name. Um, but our family goes back to uh, one of the first settlers in what is now San Antonio. We came from the Canary Islands from Spain sent by the king of spain we came up through veracruz mexico and settled in san antonio and our, my uh i'm the fourth great grandson of jose gregorio esparza who fought and died in the alamo fought alongside davy crockett and jim Bowie and all those all those cats and um yeah so you know uh, so i wrote about that you know that battle and so my kids will be able you know oh why why do we have that that song well it's because our family goes back there you know and um there's other songs like my daughter's name's 
Amelie. I wrote a song called Amelie's Song, you know, and it's just a it's a song about how when you look at your child for the first time, uh, not only do you chemically change, but you start making promises to that to that child. You know, right then and there, you're like, I will always be there for you. I will, uh, you know, uh, I will protect you, you know, um, you know, from everybody that's going to ever try to harm you. You know, I'm going to try and give you, you know, you're going to try to as a dad, you know, and uh, and try to give them the skills to survive this, like I said, this crazy world. And so, um, you know, it's it's a it's a wild thing to be a, to be an artist, but I, I truly believe in the art that I create. And that it is providing a, a legacy and an, an audio kind of autobiography, you know, an account of, of uh, this crazy life that I'm living. <laughs> it's cool stuff, man. You know, it, it really hit me too. I never even thought of that, you know, that, you know, your kids will always be able to hear their dad's voice. Your grandkids, your great, great, grand, grandkids, yeah. great, 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 great grandkids will always be able to hear uh, what what their father slash grandfather, great grandfather produced. Yeah. Right. Which is really, really yeah. cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, and hopefully they're, they're well-written songs, <laughs> <laughs> not just for, uh, not just for not, but yeah. uh, you know, uh, you know, I think that they are. And uh, you know, it's, it's a cool vibe, man. It's uh, like I said, I, I came out of, I came out of college, you know, I went to university of San Diego it was a business major down there and I got an internship up at Sony Pictures here in LA worked in marketing for film uh, for a couple of years and was on that corporate ladder that up and up you know we were talking about is this something that you always wanted to do and uh, the two things in my life that are constants are sports and uh, and music and so through my whole you know basically junior high up I was sports and music, you know, I was playing in bands and I was, I was on a travel ball team or something. And, um, and so, uh, you know, when I got that job and, and working that, you know, working that grind, you know, and, uh, the corporate ladder type of thing, um, you know, I, uh, took my boss's expense report to accounting and heard some guys who are probably about my age now. And uh, they were saying how much they didn't like their life and that grind. And so I said, you know, this is, this is probably uh, not, the, not the route for me. And so I jumped and I, and I went music full time. And uh, is that music crazy for you in the background? So listen, man, I, we, we, you're good. This is, this is dad edge. So I've, I've had, you know, other people come on <laughs> there's, there's kids in the background there's there's crazy things going on in the background, like your background and the and the stuff. It doesn't have to be perfect. I think it was um, <laughs> it was uh, oh my gosh, who was who was the person on the and and like literally there was uh, I think it was Russell Dickerson. Like it was just mad chaos going on. Like oh I remember it, yeah because it was Rus- Russell Dickerson, and he was on a park bench, and at the same time we were recording, there was this massive. Um, a uh, trash truck that came in like was was emptying the dumpsters so we heard like the you know <laughs> that yeah. and then like <laughs> so no you're good man you're hopefully good. it's not too bad, but yeah we're up here on a on a rooftop like in, in LA so <laughs> oh, you're good man actually this is a, it's much more entertaining than than being in a studio plus i got a really good producer he can drown out the background noise yeah. so we're nice right there but- um so yeah, the, the, this the whole idea of uh, you know doing the doing the corporate thing and, and the nine to five thing, which you were geared, you know, all in school to do. Uh, I just I shoved it away and I, I went music full time and just you know um, just uh, grinding it out. You know, just uh, you know I don't I don't know any way to really. I'm just uh, I've always written songs. Yeah. Since I got a guitar at, at eleven written songs and it's just kind of taken hold of my life and i've been just entranced by rock and roll and music and um it's just it's so cool i mean you, you've mentioned nikki six i mean he's one of you know i used to watch mtv you know being the youngest so i, I watched mtv a lot sooner than a lot of my uh friends and stuff so i was watching motley crew and you know white snake and poison and all that stuff yeah. you know headbangers ball you know i got into my own music yeah. Metallica and Pantera and, you know, all that kind of heavy metal stuff that I loved. Um, and, uh, 
you know, so it's like, I'm a product of, uh, I guess you could put it this way. I'm a product of my, of my dad, my parents, my mom, but also I got a, a lot of props to my, my older brothers and sisters, you know, especially my, my next oldest brother and sister, Tim and Sarah. So they, they kind of really, sh- I'm was listening to whatever they were listening to. And, um, I used to sneak into my brother's room. He was in junior high and he had a white Yamaha base and, um, he's six years older than me. And, uh, and so he was in junior high. So it looks like 13, I was at yeah, 14, maybe so 14. Yeah. Six, eight. I was about eight years old and I'm, and I'm sneaking into his room. I, you know, unclick his, his case and his base out of the, out of his case and stuff like that and uh, strap it on. And I pretend like I'm Duff McKagan, sweet child of mine, or, you know, paradise city in front of yeah. like that stadium. And, um, you know, man, it's rock and roll. Just, it just looks so cool. And it was just, uh, and, and then, you know, it's like, you wanted to be Nikki six and you wanted to be Bo Jackson, you know, those guys. Were like, <laughs> you know? So I don't know. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's cool, yeah. man. I, I've got, so I, I have four boys, not 10 kids, four boys. Uh, I have a 16 year old, a 14 year old, eight year old and six year old. And, you know, not to, not to pigeonhole or stereotype or anything like that. So like what I've noticed, and I noticed this grow, growing up myself, that you either had your music kids or your athletes. Very rarely did you have one that was a combination of both. Like I even see that in my oldest, my oldest, he runs track, but he prefers like he loves band like he's a band kid like he he can play saxophone trombone bass guitar electric guitar drums and piano and like he loves music and he'll run track but in his mind he's like i don't want anything to do with those athletes i'll go run i'll go run my sprints like i'm good with that and i'll throw a discus but otherwise man give me something to play and then my 14 year old he's been playing football for five years he's about ready to go into high school football and he's like i don't want any part of music like i just want to like go crush somebody on on the on the field so it's cool that you've actually you've done both of these i i do have a question for you about while your time working at sony pictures were, were you married at the time no i was um so i met my wife so I was just doing an internship. So, you know, um, my wife, I met her at uh, our graduation party for, uh, from college. So my buddy in Huntington Beach was having a party. Um, I knew him from college. My wife came. I had not met her before. She knew him from high school. And uh, she walked right in. And I just came for the tacos and beer. And I'm sitting back, you know, I've I'm, I'm got a week before graduation. I don't have any classes. I'm just partying it's gonna be a good time and she walks in this blonde haired blue eyed girl with legs you know just beautiful and I walked right up to her like you know those old cartoons where uh where there's like a dog and it's sleeping and then there's a pie that sits out on the sill and there's a little aroma scent visual that kind of wakes the dog up and the dog gets led over there it's kind of how it was man I just got right up I walked up to her I said hi my name's David I like your shoes and uh, it <laughs> was like wow okay. <laughs> and and so we just talked all night man and uh so that was it i was you know and then um i started uh working this internship as i was dating her and um at you know at sony and uh i was living in this man i had a bed one day i was living across the street from ucla in a sublet for the summer with my drummer and um and uh, I was, you know, going to work every day, you know, uh, this internship thing. But I had a bed one day. And then the next day I didn't have a bed. I guess the guy who was I, we were subleasing from, he took it out of the room or something like that. So I slept on the floor and my wife went through that. And there were like cockroaches this is right next to the fraternity houses and stuff like that. So there's like cockroaches and stuff. But we had, you know, we, I just put some blankets down. I mean, she's been through it all with me, even in my rock and roll days through my 20s and stuff like that. Um, you know, so yes, we, we've pretty much my whole adult life. I've been with my wife. Um, you know, there was, uh, right after college. Yeah. Right after college, been with her for a long time now. So, yeah. yeah. Well, so here we are again, you talking <laughs> about somebody who's very, very important in your life. 
and yeah. the tone in your voice, the look on your face, man, you have like nothing but love for this woman. Um, what is a, what, what's a few things that you just really honor and appreciate about her? Oh, I think number one is that besides her shoes. Yeah. Besides <laughs> I can, and I remember her, her uh, wedge black heels because they were, they just made her legs look so long and, and it's that, first initial thing where you're just like, wow, this is beautiful. This, I gotta, I gotta meet you. So, um, but, uh, I think uh, the number one thing, cause you know, I was dating a ton, a ton in college and I was in a rock and roll band too at the time. So I met a lot of, a lot of ladies, um, you know, before my wife. And I think the thing that I loved about her was that she had a brain and she was, uh, she challenged me. It was, she's a strong Sicilian. You know, so she's got an opinion and she will call me on my shit. And, um, you know, and I think that that's number one. You got to have a strong, strong woman, you know, and a smart one. And that's what immediately attracted me to her. Plus, you know, she uh, she knew music. She was a big Aerosmith fan, um, you know, guns, all that stuff that, you know, I was into uh, Guns and Roses. And, you know, um, she knew all that rock and roll. She had the right rock and roll pedigree, I think. <laughs> Um, and she was uh, a big baseball. She could talk baseball sports with me. Um, and she was willing to go on an adventure. I remember that first summer. Um, let me tell you the difference between a girl that I didn't choose and then my wife. So I was trying to date this girl at the same time that I was uh, started to date my wife. So, so you know, uh, there's a girl... At the end of college, I was like, well, this is my last chance, you know, to try and date her. So I tried to take her on dates and stuff like that. And it just wasn't vibing. And, um, and then I met my wife or, you know, at the time and, uh, and she just knocked my socks off. But then I gave the, the other girl one more last time, went down to Laguna and, uh, was hanging out with her at a friend's house. And we were like, Hey, let's go get, uh, let's go get in the water. She's like, I don't really like to swim. I like to sunbathe. I'm like, let's go jump off that rock over there. You know, just you know, she just wasn't down to do anything. And then, um, dating my wife, she was like, Hey, let's go here. Let's go there. Let's, you know, it was exciting. And, um, I said, let's go to Mazatlan, you know, like, uh, after my internship's done, let's, let's just go to Mazatlan. Like we have no money, but we're just getting plane flight and just make it up. You know, as we go there, she's like, sure, let's do it. So I think that sense of adventure and that willingness to just go and do and explore and just I knew she was down for life. You know, it was that whole thing about, you know, this is a girl that's strong, but yet she's, she's up for an adventure and, and, uh, you know, we got enough of the similar interests and stuff. Just, it all makes sense, man. It just did all. And I wasn't looking for it either. I wasn't looking for her that day. And I think it's when you stop looking for somebody and I tell buddies and stuff like that, because I got a lot of guys in my band that are younger in their twenties and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're all on the bumble and the Tinder and stuff like that and whatever. And it's a totally different world than what I dated in and stuff. And, uh, they're all in that world. And I'm just like, man, it's going to happen. when you least expect it. Like it's just going to happen and you're going to know, you know? So, you know, it sounds like your wife and mine, they have like, there's a, there's a lot of common ground there. My, my wife, um, <laughs> Yeah, she's she's really big. In, and I, I've I've dated women in the past that were just like, kind of like that sort of princess. Like, oh no, I won't do that. Like, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to get dirty. I don't want to get sweaty. You know, like all this sort of stuff. And my wife, I always, you know, when when guys ask me, they're like, well, "What's your wife like?" I was like, "My wife is a badass. Like, she'll go. To, she'll put her hair. She'll she'll put on a kick ass pair of yoga pants. She'll put her hair up in a ponytail. She'll kill you and crush you in the gym." punch you in the arm, then go out and have a beer with you and lunch afterwards. And yeah. always up for an adventure, always up to go somewhere and try something new, which is great. But I, I love that about her. And it yeah. sounds like your, your wife is very similar. That That's really cool, man. How, how long have you guys been together? Uh, this will be our 14th wedding anniversary this year. Yes. I think. Congrats, so, man. Yeah. yeah and man. then, yeah. uh, Obviously, so two kids, eleven and seven. Daughter yeah. is the oldest. Son is the is the younger. Are you are daughter, you guys, you guys done? Daughter, and son is the uh, son is the younger. We are done. Yeah, that would be a that would be a, a tough, be a hard yes. Yeah, or, yeah, no. Our our youngest would ended up 
would end up being like uh, the babysitter, you know, right. basically. Like, I don't know. Yeah, we're all done. She said shop's closed and I, you know, it's her body. You know, I'm just, uh, we're just having a good time. <laughs> you know? So it's, hey, whatever she wants to do, I'm cool with. Um, she didn't even want kids. I think initially kids never played a picture. And then me coming from a big family, I really wanted kids, of course. And I really wanted the family. So, um, and she was like, yeah, sure, let's do it. You know, and we had one of each and she had great pregnancies with both. So we're like, you know what, let's not push our luck. You know, happy to have two healthy um, kids, one of each. And um, they're, they're amazing, man. And, you know, you change. It's the greatest thing you could ever do is become, become a parent, I think. And um, because one of the reasons uh, why I tell my, my band members and stuff like that, because they'll ask me and stuff like that, what's it like having kids? Or what's it like, you know, so it's like, I'm kind of like the guy, the, the wise man with knowledge, I guess now or something. But, uh, you know, it's like, man, you, you chemically change. Like you, it's like, like that, yeah. when that baby comes out, you change, you start seeing things different priorities change. Everything changes, man. Scent in the air changes. It's just, uh, it's, it's a thing. And, uh, when you see another dad, you like, you get it, you know, you're part of the club. Right. Um, you know, you get, uh, all the madness, the crazy, how you're feeling, all that kind of good stuff. And, uh, you know, but, uh, man, it's, uh, it's a wild, wild ride. And one that, uh, I couldn't imagine not taking, like I said, though, it, it, um, you get to, I don't remember the beginning of my life, you know, it's all a fuzzy, hazy thing, right? <laughs> the basically five years below, you know, six years below. I don't, I don't remember that stuff and uh, maybe bits and pieces, but now you get to see it and you get to see life come full circle you know, and, uh, to see another life being brought into the world, uh, through a woman that you, that you absolutely adore and your partner in crime. And you just, the amount of respect that you have for your wife after your pregnancy is like, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it. You know, women are amazing. They're, they're, they're the strength. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We, we may be physically, you know, we can lift some stuff, but a woman is a totally different animal, you know, and a complicated creature. But, uh, when we, uh, we love so much and uh yeah man it uh it's a cool thing just to see life come full circle like that yeah about you yeah that yeah oh my god yeah same thing you know um i remember <clears throat> first time i became a father you know 16 years ago and i just remember being uh just scared shitless out of my mind like <laughs> that's what pretty much like was, i was very happy but i was also like Oh my God, this is, this is big. Yep. Right? And by yep. the way, I have no freaking clue how to do any of this. So that's why I started the podcast actually. But yeah, you know, there's, I, I don't, I, I remember my own father who I actually didn't even know until I was 30, kind of crazy story there. But um, we now we've had a relationship now for the past 17 years, but I remember my dad telling me, he's like, you actually won't really remember what life was like before your kids. And I'm like, no, I think I will. I mean, it's like all this stuff and all this, right. But he's right. Like I really, it, it's almost like you evolve so much as a person once you become a parent that you're almost like, it's kind of like the COVID thing, right? It's like, okay, there's pre-COVID and post-COVID and the world is different at both ends. But, but yeah, I don't really remember what it was like before kids. Yeah. It's uh well, I mean, they just become so part of your life and it's yeah. weird to rem imagine you without them because right. they're always, <laughs> you know, so. Very true. A, yeah, man. But, uh, yeah, the, the last question I have for you, because it's, um, you know, I, 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 I gotta admit, man, I've, I've done almost a thousand of these interviews and, yeah. uh, I haven't given a, the, the guy, the, the, the brothers out there, man, the, the fellow dads who have daughters, a whole lot of uh, tools because I don't, I don't have a whole lot when it comes to that. I only got the boys. <laughs> Um, yeah, all boys. Yeah. All boys. Yeah. It's like a drunk fraternity house that you never leave. That's my house. Like I find things just, I found a half eaten peanut butter and jelly sandwich on my bathroom sink a few weeks ago. Like just literally just sitting there. I'm like, how does this even get in here? Bro. Please, uh. <laughs> it's like, right. And I mean, then I ate it and then, you know, after that. <laughs> but um, I'm really curious, man. Like how, how do you go about and and man, like, the youngest of 10, I can only imagine some of the things you experienced growing up yeah. you know, good and maybe like, wow, this is kind of crazy. But like for you, what, what's most important for you of how you approach raising a daughter 
how you approach raising this young man? So we didn't find out um, if we were having a, a boy or a girl. We waited. And uh, that was a really cool surprise. So we just asked for a lot of clothes in yellow. And, uh, Good move. And, you know, but truth be told, like, I, I wanted a boy because I'm a boy and I know, I think I can manage a boy, you know, like I know how to deal with a boy. Um, and so my daughter came out and uh, she had the cord wrapped around her neck. Oh, no. We didn't know at the time our doctor was really good. So he didn't really alarm us or anything. He just said, you need to push now. My daughter came out and the excitement of everything. It's my first child I'm seeing being born. I didn't, um, I'm just, you know, I thought I cut the cord, but they had already cut it. <laughs> I cut something, you know, I cut a little piece off, but it wasn't like cutting the cord away from my wife. They had already done that because, you know, and you're thinking back, you're like, wow, that, that all makes sense. Like, yeah, she was a little, she was purple and the doctor was very stern and I didn't cut the cord and you know, Oh, that makes so much sense. Yeah. So we didn't know, but also when they brought her out, they're like, congratulations, you know, like after they did the things that they needed to do and said, congratulations. And I'm looking at this little baby and I'm like, what is it? <laughs> you know? Cause I didn't know because everything was swollen, like looking, you know, and I'm like, I don't know if the little kid just falls out. I don't know. Like where I, my first baby being born, I have no idea. You know? So uh, they're like, it's a girl. And I'm like, and I'm in love, <laughs> you know, and it was just kind of like, she's my little princess. She's my little thing. But <clears throat> we didn't know if we were, you're not guaranteed anything in this life, let alone, uh, you know, a child of the opposite sex. So I knew that I was like, well, I'm going to treat this one like she's kind of like a boy in a way, you know. So I took, you know, it was uh, got her a baseball tee and, you know, a stroller. It got her, um, you know, a skateboard and, you know, um, you know, a, a kitchen set, you know, thing. It was always like you get everything and I'm going to you know, I want you to be well-rounded um, because, you know, I, I have a bunch of sisters and stuff like that. And I, you know, I love that. Um, you know, you know, I had a lot of girl friends. Yeah, when I was growing up that were, that I would hang out with that were just so cool. And they were, you know, they knew sports. My wife, you know, knows sports better than most men, you know? And it's like, okay, yeah, we can give her everything. We don't have to get everything that's pink, you know? Um, you know, it's crazy because my wife was growing up, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, options for baseball gloves, that kind of thing now or softball gloves and stuff and now when my daughter's playing softball it's like there's pink gloves and pink this and purple this and all this kind of stuff and we just kind of have raised her just to be a strong independent um you know talk about you know subjects and such you know like for example in my you know we're getting into that weird area where she's like that pre pre-tween tween thing i don't know like before she's a teenager and stuff but she's asking questions she's pretty mature she's asking questions like um you know she's about to go through her period and stuff like that and so she was asking about you know the egg and all that kind of stuff so we watched look who's talking you know the other day with her and you know we we you know <laughs> that's awesome okay so that's the egg and that's where it comes in this is the you know every month it's going to come down it's going to this oh that's crazy so she get a visual We've never steered away from tough questions that she's asked. You know, we talk about, you know, you can be, um, you know, whoever that you love, you know, and whoever that you want to marry, whether it's a boy or a girl, you know, you can do so. Um, just let her know that uh, I think I've ne we've just never shied away from, we never really spoke to her like a baby either. Um, like, oh, da -be -da -be -da baby, you know, type of stuff, you know, baby talk. We always kind of spoke to her like, you know, under like, like a person would talk to somebody. And, um, and I think we've taken that approach to um, my daughter and my son in just, hey, look, you know, this is how we talk to people. This is this is the respect we show. This is manners. This is this. This is that. Um, I don't know. You know, I got a really good examples just in our own parents. So it's like, we just kind of saw what we liked in our, in our parent style, took what we liked, saw what we could make better, 
you know, the camping, the nature stuff. I'm a big, I love nature, getting outside. We've done a lot of that stuff. Um, fishing, you know, I want to take my, my daughter hiking up Baldy, Mount Baldy over here. Um, you know, for my birthday, I always like to climb a mountain. Last year, I climbed Mount Whitney by myself with my buddies and stuff. But I want to get her hiking up those mountains with me. And um, I've always just taken her along with me. And I think that's uh, that's the thing, whether I was doing radio interviews or whatever, she always just came with. And I do a lot of stuff, you know, like surfing, you know, uh, running. I would, you know, run long distances. She'd be in the stroller. So it's like, you know, just do shit with your, with your daughter. That's, that's what it is. I think just do shit with your daughter. Do, do everything with her. She's, you know, just because she has different body parts and, you know, and is going to mother children one day, hopefully, um, doesn't mean that you, you treat them really any different. I mean, there's a, a definitely a different, you know, a little bit more care that you take, you know, with your daughter, she's your little girl, but and she's going to break your heart a million times over. And you know that, um, that's one of those things where you're just not looking forward to that, but you know, it's going to come. Um, but, uh, you know, just do, just do things with them. My, my wife goes, she's like, you always think about Emily, you know, like, uh, like you want to go do this and that with her too. Like, you know, well, I'm like, well, you, I know you don't want to go do this. She's like, yeah, but you could ask me. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so it's mm-hmm. like, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm far from perfect, you know, and I tend to um, try and go do things with my daughter just to give her experience before I ask my wife at times, you know? Um, so that's where I get into trouble sometimes, but uh, my daughter's cool. She's a little badass, man. She's like, like, and she's the same way. My wife is like, yeah, I'll go surfing. My, my son's a little bit a little more, more high maintenance, you know, and uh, your kids, you realize that, um, they're a little, they have their personalities when they come out, you know, and, um, and my daughter's a little bit more go with the flow and I can deal with that a little bit better. So I tend to take her, um, out a little bit more, you know, that's just the way I've always been with her. So that's really cool, man. You know, it's, it's interesting. You talk about like how you just talk to her as if she's just a person. We, we did that. We we've done that with our oldest and we, we call him the young adult or sometimes even the third parent. Cause we're just like, sometimes he'll just jump right in. We're like, yeah, like Ethan, Ethan, we got it, man. Come on. You know, I'm like we, it's not your job, bro. You know, just call you out, you know, and you're oh, like, yeah. you're actually making a whole lot of sense there. I am. I, I, yeah. Yeah. You're like, you side with them. You're like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I am. I, I don't know why I was thinking that. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Sometimes there's no better accountability partner than your kids. Um, last, qu- last question I have for you. Is what about, uh, what about your son? Like how, what's most important and meaningful for you to raise a strong young man? I just, I think accountability, you just brought that up. I think that that is probably accountability. So we have this motto in our family and I was, we talked about the cool things with, with uh, the lockdown and, and the COVID thing. Uh, that you got to do. Well, I was able to be my son's t-ball coach That's cool. and the league coach this year, you know, coach pitch this year and t-ball previous year. Um, and, um, but we have a family motto and I told it to my, my players as well. And it's the four rules and our kind of our, our, our motto, you know, our credo, like what we, what we think of um, it's focus, listen, try your hardest and never give up. And I think if you do, I try to instill that with him. Uh, sometimes he, he wants to give it up a little sooner than, you know, where he's a little bit more temperamental than my, my daughter, um, you know. And so it's just ingraining those four things because I just think that it's so important for uh, the world is a, is a crazy place. We've said that before, right? And it'll eat you up and, and chew you out or chew you up and spit you out. Right. And, um, we all come at a time where you, you come into these life lessons and you hope to learn them a little bit sooner in life, uh, than, than later, for example, um, uh, you know, when I was in college, I went to community college for the first two years 
and I was in the scholars program. And then I had my girlfriend in high school or that I was dating since high school. She broke up with me. Right. So you had your heart broken. I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, all this stuff life's over type of not life's over, but like, you know, like, Oh, that's the worst thing ever. And, um, and I got like, I went on the, uh, academic probation that first semester of college. Cause I was just so like, I can't even like think right now, like this girl just tore my heart out, you know? And, um, and then I ended up getting straight A's after that. Cause I started bucking up and going, Hey, look, this is my parents aren't going to, you know, I'm not going to be able to skate by here. It's my name, uh, you know, and it's, uh, it's accountability, you know. So I learned that lesson at that time, which was perfect. And it kind of, you know, finished college with, you know, B plus average type thing. And, and it was just kind of like, you know, one of those things where you just learn those life lessons. And it was that focus, listen, try your hardest, never give up, you know, and, and just the whole determination thing, you know. I think uh, uh, I'm digressing a bit, but I just think that in raising a son, I think it's very much in the same as raising a daughter. I think that you want to raise them in the same, same capacity, same, same way. You just want to raise solid human beings that are accountable, that uh, are going to put some good into this world. And, um, you know, they're not going to, uh, they have a, like a never say die attitude, you know, because, you know, it, it's, it's tough, man. So I think you just, you know, and, and that care, the, you know, these kids also, you want to rule with a loving hand, you know, type of a thing. Cause that's super important. They got to know love. They know love from you, uh, especially your daughter. You know, if, if uh, she goes that way, you know, that you're going to be what she models. I'm very uh, cognizant of that. She's going to, the way I talk to my wife is the same way that she's going to look for her example, you know, so that's huge. And uh, the way, the love that you give your wife, um, she's going to see that. And also your son is going to model that. I mean, they're going to model you. They're just, you're little, you're setting them up for success or failure. And that's a tough, uh, it's a tough weight to, to, to shoulder, but it's like, you got to provide a good example yeah. or at least an example that you want, that you see is right that you would like to have them go towards. So I, <laughs> there was so much there, man. Sorry. I know I, no, in a really good way. Um, because I, I love how, you know, it's like, Hey, at the end of the day, we're raising these people to be good human beings that are going to contribute to society. Right. And accountability. Yeah. You said that over and over again, which I think is great. Accountability, accountability, you know, how we, how we raise, you know, these, these, uh, these boys in this house is, and it's really, really telling my wife and I, you know, and I'm not saying this to toot, toot our own horn because like, I am an idiot. Like I make so many mistakes today. It's not even funny. Like I just, I'm, I'm an idiot father from time to time. Right. But, but one, one thing I can, yeah, we all are. Right. But you know, th there's one thing that I can really like hang my hat on. And that is, I do think that my wife and I, we have found this perfect, like common ground of compassion, empathy, love, and tough love. Like we're no pushovers. Like we're strict. My, my wife is, I call her. I was like, I was like, you are a tough mom of boys for sure. Like that, there's a reason she doesn't have daughters. Right. And it's because she's a badass mom of four boys. But one thing that's really cool about the boys is that, you know, and if, I scratch my head because even my 16 and 14 year old, they're just, they're here a lot. Like they like hanging out here. Their friends come here. They, they come up and say good night to us or we go downstairs and say good night to them every single night. My, my two boys will still hug and kiss my wife like good night. All right. And especially my 14 year old, he's like this, he's a monster, like football player athlete, but he's like a teddy bear with my wife, which I think is awesome. But we also don't let them get away with anything. Right. Yeah. And like the other thing too, is like, we don't spoil them. Like, like if my kids want something, I'm like, well, you make some money to go get that thing. Like right? <laughs> go for it. accountability. Right. So, well, man, this is really good stuff. As we end the show here, David, I want to make sure 
Um, everybody knows where to follow you, your social media, but most importantly too, like where to find this new album and what's yeah. the best place to go grab that. Yeah. Just go to David Rosales music.com or you can just go to anywhere your favorite, uh, streaming service, you know, revive is the name of the album. Um, David Rosales is the name of the artist and, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, some good summer vibes. Um, and, uh, yeah, to put you in the right headspace to, uh, take on the world as a, as a fellow dad. <laughs> That's cool, man. That's cool. You know, I, I posted on social media that I was going to be interviewing you. I had a couple of people reach out and tell me that we look like we're related to some degree. So I just throw, <laughs> maybe throw a beard on me. I'm right there with you. Yeah, man. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, man. Well, guys, hey, not to worry. We're going to have all the links in the show notes for you. Uh, we'll, we'll have all the places that David uh, suggested here to make sure you can go pick up his album. Head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash 384 for this show. Again, the dadedge.com forward slash 384. Uh, David, dude, this was, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan, man. This, this was cool, dude. I really, really enjoy talking to you. Well, I appreciate you. And thanks for taking some time to uh, talk to me on top of a rooftop here in Los Angeles. And <laughs> Made it yeah. I mean, Definitely. Okay, brother. Okay, man. I appreciate you. And uh, gentlemen, go out and live legendary. Take care.